Hi, this is Bob Costas, and you're listening to the ML Sports Platter. The ML Sports Platter all over the major platforms, Spotify, Google, Apple, Stitcher, Deezer. Download, subscribe, leave feedback, and a five-star review. We are brought to you by the Allen Angus Pub, Ken's Auto Detailing, and Axe Exotic Pets. Get on over to Axe Exotic Pets if you're in and around Central New York. Route 11 in Cicero. They've got unbelievable snakes, lizards, birds, aquariums for all of your special pets as well. Axe Exotic Pets, terrific place to go get your exotic pet or go get all the amenities for the one you currently have. Axe Exotic Pets, go find them on Facebook and check out uh, that page for incoming uh, exotic pets that they get in on a regular basis. Before I bring in my man John Garcia Jr., who is just, I mean, he's one of the best uh, in the media industry, period, no matter what sport and, and what guys and gals cover, um, but he, you know, so close to the recruiting, uh, side of things. He's the director of football for recruiting for Sports Illustrated, college football, uh, recruiting analyst, SI now, SI all American, yellow hammer football as well. Uh, and he's on Twitter at John Garcia underscore junior. I want to get into name, image, and likeness and how it impacts recruiting as far as where guys may go, uh, in college football. But before we get to all of that. I want to get into the golf year a little bit. Um, I think it's been an unbelievable year. I really do. I think when you look at just straight up the, the the major winners, right? Obviously, the big story, Phil Mickelson, right? Oldest guy to win a major in the history by cap uh, of the game by capturing the PGA Championship. Uh, you've had John Rahm win the U.S. Open, first Spaniard to do that. Certainly, a global impact, not just in that country, but also European golf. I think it's a tremendous win and. You know, look, he he commented in the post game about it. He said, "This is this is a huge win for me for Spain." Seve Ballesteros tried to win it and couldn't. And look, there's there's a mutual respect. Americans competing across the pond in the the Open Championship and other European tournaments. There's a major respect factor there, much like the Europeans coming over from, you know, Ireland, uh, uh, Germany. Um, you know, Spain, etc., coming over, and even, you know, the Far East, uh, many places, and coming over and playing our championship of the U.S. Open, knowing that it's probably the greatest grind mentally in golf, right? I mean, the only thing that probably compares is the Ryder Cup. Um, but this was a hell of a win for Rahm. He had fought the adversity of coming back, the corona situation, the contract tracing, uh, contact tracing at the at the memorial was leading the tournament was pretty much in the bag and has to leave. Uh, that was a big blow, and then obviously he couldn't prepare for the U.S. Open how he wanted to. But Torrey Pines is a special place. He's got a lot of memories there with his wife. Uh, he was on that 18th green, uh, getting the trophy, seeing his wife, seeing his new child on Father's Day. It was a terrific moment for golf, and I think a terrific moment really for Spanish golf or European golf. Uh, he breaks through. Uh, same deal with Hideki Matsuyama, you know, winning the Masters, and that's going to basically make him a, a nice, cool two, three, four million dollars in endorsements, if not more, here in the short term. Uh, certainly, a lot in the long term. But but both Matsuyama and Rom, guys who uh, were knocking on that major door, I think, for quite a while, right? And now they finally got them. Uh, so that was great to see. And again, Japanese golf, the young players who started playing the game, they look up to their countrymen. Uh, now they're going to look up to them even more and say, oh, I'm, I'm sticking with golf. I want to be Hideki Matsuyama. I want to be John Rahm and be the, by the time I get to wherever, the third or fourth Spanish champion, let's say, or maybe even the second, if no you know, other Spaniard wins it after Rahm here in the not-too-distant future. You know, If they're not into the game, maybe they get into the game. So, it's layered. I mean, the impact is layered when a John Rahm wins or a Hideki Matsuyama wins in terms of the global impact. Um, you know, we've got, as you record this, we've got the Open Championship coming up at Royal St. George's where Shane Lowry, uh, you know, is a defending champion. Um, just a lot of really, really good stuff after that. And, you know, I've really gotten used to the PGA Championship in May. At first, I was like, man, I 
kind of like it in August, this and that. But by the same token, now time has gone on, and I, I actually kind of like you know one major per month. First four months: April Masters, May PGA, June U.S. Open, July Open Championship. Then we just move into some other stuff. We move into 3M Open. We move into the FedEx St. Jude uh, WGC. We move into the Wyndham. We move into the BMW. We move into the Tour Championship in September. And this year, of course, it works out even better because we got to make up the Ryder Cup at Whistling Straits in Kohler, Wisconsin. So um, this is a big, big thing. It's a great, great, great year so far, I think, in golf. Phil Mickelson, you know, winning the PGA Championship. I mean, that was an unbelievable an unbelievable moment for golf. And, and now Phil, I mean, when you look at, you know, Phil Mickelson and, and, and his career, you know, and where he stacks up. And I was talking with a good friend over the 4th of July about this. When, when you look at the most majors, you know, you go Nicholas 18, you know, Woods, um, you know, Woods 15. And, you, you know, you go down the list, right? You go down the list. Uh, and, and there aren't many people now, um, who, who have the wins like Phil. I mean, you, 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 you know, it, it's, uh, man, I mean, he's right there. And I think overall, I think that, um, I think Phil will go up a notch historically because he is the oldest to win a major. And by the way, if, if somebody else wins one who's older, Phil maybe gets even more credit because he was the first and he set the tone, set the pioneer, you know, he set 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 it up as a pioneer. And Phil Mickelson really, I mean, let's be honest, I mean, probably the greatest short game of all time. Uh, the careers are the, the career arc is spectacular. Doesn't have a US Open to his resume, but has won everything else. Once he got the monkey off his back at the Masters, he took off. And look, here's there's only these golfers ahead of him. Harry Varden was seven. Bobby, jo these players have seven. Varden, Jones, Sears, and Sneed Palmer. Watson has eight. Player has nine. Hogan has nine. Hagen, 11. 15, Tiger. Jack Nicholas with 18. That's it. As the young millennial cool kid group would say on Twitter, that's it. That's the list. And so I, man alive, I'm telling you, it's been really great. It's been really great to see. And just the year, I think, overall in golf has been has been really awesome. Um, I think, you know, Mickelson, the Global Impact, Rom, Matsuyam, et cetera. And, and, and we've seen other little things take place, too, here in, you know, I guess what has been the lap over of, you know, the Corona year and all that. Uh, we've seen, you know, uh, from last fall, we you know, we've seen Sergio Garcia. You know, he won the Sanderson Farms. Uh, we've seen great outings from the likes of, you know, play, probably players like Martin Laird and Patrick Cantley and Brian Gay and uh, Robert Streb and, and some unknowns kind of coming in. We've seen some comeback wins. Uh, by players. I mean, look at Daniel Berger winning the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro. And that was a hell of a win. Jordan Spieth, you know, goes to his goes to his home state of Texas, wins the Valero. A lot of people were writing him off, which was ridiculous because Jordan Spieth is so young. And I think if he retired today with his multiple majors, he'd waltz into the Hall of Fame. Like, come on, um, can't write off a guy like that. Um, I just think that this year has been really good. We've seen a lot of cool things, a lot of highlights, even outside the majors. It's been really fun to watch. You know, Harris English with a great performance at the Travelers. So terrific, terrific golf year so far. Plenty more to come. Open championships going to be amazing as always. You wake up and just start watching golf. Justin Thomas defending his, 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 his World Golf Championship FedEx will be good. Dustin Johnson defending the Tour. And, hey, Speaking of that John Rahm fellow, he is a defending BMW champ in late August as well. And that Northern Trust in New Jersey, uh, Jersey City, Jersey, is one of the best tournaments out there. Dustin Johnson defending that. So we've got some we've got some Titanic players defending their tournaments here in the coming months with Rahm Johnson and uh, and Tom and Thomas, uh, and then of course Shane Lowry at the Open Championship. Pretty cool year so far. In golf, the ML Sports Platter is brought to you by our good friends at Bryant and Stratton College, Welch and Company Jewelers, and 
Sit means sit Syracuse. If you're in and around Central New York, the best dog training in town, any breed, any behavior, and any dog. Sit means sit Syracuse. You can find them on Facebook and on Instagram and visit their website, sitmeansit.com, and find your branch. Syracuse's best dog training. Get started with a free evaluation today. See the training, see the videos, the trainers, testimonials, and more at sitmeansit.com. Syracuse, New York, if you're in and around the area, go with them today. David and his staff do an unbelievable job. Let's bring him in. John Garcia, Jr., Director of Football Recruiting for Sports Illustrated, a college football recruiting analyst, SI Now, SI All-American, Yellowhammer Football, on Twitter, at John Garcia underscore Jr., a must-follow and a good pal of mine. Garcia, how are you, bud? Always good to be on with you, my friend. I'm doing well. How about you? I'm 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 good, thank you. Name, image, and likeness here, big deal. I I think it's always been the way to go. There's just it's just too hard to figure out, you know, paying the rock star football player and the sport that moves the needle, right? And then well, we gotta pay the rower, and no disrespect to rowing or lacrosse or soccer or volleyball, but we know the sports that bring in the main money. This way, every single uh uh athlete, male and female, can kind of go out and do his or her own thing. Uh, what do you think early stages of name, image, and likeness here, John? And as a follow-up to that, how do you think it will impact where kids want to go in college football? Because you have the power fives and all the rest, but if there's a kid at, in, in Cleveland who thinks he has a better opportunity to go start at Miami of Ohio instead of riding the pine at a power five and make money doing it, he may. I mean, it might change those, those people's minds, right? So give me, give me your thoughts on those two things. Yeah, well, first, my I think NIL has been really positive uh, right out of the gates. Uh, there's still a lot of unknown. We're, we're six days into it. Um, but you've seen a lot of great success, whether it's, you know, in college football, whether it's Derek King. Uh, we've heard good things about Brock Vandergrip. So many different players who have been able to partner with a company or at least start something, create an opportunity, whether, you know, even on their own, whether it's uh, we've seen Florida defensive lineman Gervon Dexter selling T-shirts or – uh, Bo Nix, the quarterback from Auburn, uh, paired with Milo's Sweet Tea, you know, so regional, hyper-local. We've seen all sorts of partnerships, uh, even with, with Instagram companies that just make edits, like College Football Edits has several players linked up uh, with NIL. So you, you've seen um, basically everybody taking advantage to some degree, and you've seen others play it a little bit more conservatively, thinking about the long play. Let's see how it shuffles out here at the beginning. And then I'll start to make my decision. So you're, you're just forcing maturity. You're forcing uh, a degree of financial literacy with with young, uh, you know, soon to be young professionals. Uh, so that is always important just in, in general economically. But obviously empowering the players is something that is not going to slow down. Paying the players has long been inevitable. Now it's just a question of, you know, where, where in the gray areas does this thing evolve into? Because you know it's coming and then, the greater picture, as you mentioned, um, where do the non-revenue sports, Olympic sports, start to play into this, um, whether it's revenue sharing, et cetera. Those are big fights yet to come all the way up on, on Capitol Hill. But at least at a minimum, if you have value and another person or company thinks you have value, regardless of sport, gender, uh, level, all of that, now you can profit off of that. And I actually think that's a great thing. Because now some of those some of those more niche niche followings take you know lacrosse in Syracuse or take wrestling uh, in Iowa or hockey at North Dakota. Now those athletes in those markets can can feel a little bit more valued or a lot more valued uh, relative to to the perception of hey this is a football and, and then it's basketball kind of deal. And then in terms of where it affects these decisions, my gosh, the possibilities are endless. I, I always say in recruiting, Mike, everybody has a sell, right? If you're Nick Saban, the sell is help us maintain what we're doing and become the next high draft pick, Heisman candidate, blah, blah, blah. If you're the worst team in the Power Five, if you're Kansas, your sell is, hey, help us get out of this basement. Help us climb. Help us be the start of, of the, the reversal of perception of this program. And then you've got yourselves everywhere in between. Now with NIL, it, it intensifies a little bit more. Um, if you're a bigger market team uh, that doesn't necessarily have the, the strong perception, I'm thinking, you know, UCLA, Miami of, of Florida, Rutgers. Think of big markets that are nearby. Now you can sell that a little bit more. And as you mentioned, your second, third tier FBS programs, 
Now it's part of your pitch when you are trying to pull a prospect from the Power Five to say, hey, come here, your, your light will, will shine a little bit brighter a little bit sooner, and now you can capitalize on that monetarily that much quicker than you would at, at School X, at Ohio State, at Clemson, at, at Georgia. So I do think that this increases the reach of, quote-unquote, everyone has a sale, everyone has a pitch, everyone has an angle that they can look to execute. So I do think this expands the field for, for those middle-tier, second, third-tier prospects, but I still believe those top-tier guys are still going to go to the big schools. The Blue Bloods will still benefit the most because they have the most resources. They have the most uh, flexibility. They have the most buy-in from the athletic department. So it will help the best get better, but I do think it, there's some movement beyond that um, for both player and program. I think you're spot on. I, I just I see the, the words that come to mind for me, John, are, are just it, wide open. I mean, it, it's... You know, it's it's just wide, wide open, wide open, wide open, un- unlimited opportunities. You have an unbelievable opportunity if you're at another school to just say, you know, hey, I'm not, I'm not in, uh, uh, in a position to go to NC State and wait till my senior year to be the starting wide receiver. You know, over here, I got an opportunity at Coastal Carolina. Or, you know, I, I can't get on the roster at Iowa as a starter till my senior year. I'm going to go to a a, a Mac school. Uh, and, and all of a sudden that decision makes you, it could make you a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars while you're in school and you're playing football. That, that, that's, that's pretty good. 100%. Uh, and, and the way it's already starting to filter down, is, it's been kind of remarkable that, you know, we've seen, I think a Jacksonville state women's volleyball player sign with, with March school, mm-hmm. you know, so mm-hmm. they, I mean, it's just the, the reach is, is going to continue to push sort of outward. Um, especially with social media, you know, that we're seeing sponsored tweets, there you go. Instagram posts, things yep. like that. So, I mean, it could be when you're in college, man, you know, 20, 30 bucks for anything oh. easy <laughs> is a big deal. <laughs> so, two racks I of beer, it. two racks of PBR even, you know? <laughs> yeah, PBR, stand up. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> um, you know, if, if a company, it doesn't have to be, you know, Mercedes-Benz or sure. McDonald's. It can be your local your local corner store market uh, that says, hey, you know, 10 bucks a tweet if you can tweet once a week about us. I mean, kids are going to take advantage of every level, and I think that's the best thing about it. Yeah, no doubt. Elite 11, I know that was something that you were uh, on pretty good uh, about a week ago or so, right, John? So what is Elite 11? And and get into the coverage here a little bit with the, the rankings and the charting, and, of course, the most important position of all, the quarterback. Yeah, so the Elite 11 is, I would say, widely considered the most prestigious quarterback event uh, in, in college football recruiting. It's always right at the end of June into July, uh, and it tries to you know bring in the top quarterbacks at the high school level and pair them with college counselors who, who have sort of been there, done that. Sometimes NFL coaches, NFL counselors come back and, and give back as well. So it becomes this sort of uh, this marathon week of, of what being a quarterback means. So, of course, there's a ton of on-field stuff, but then they do a lot of off-the-field stuff as well, whether it's board work, plays, uh, interactive uh, you know, VR stuff. Uh, they get back to the community. They do yoga. They hit the beach. It's kind of this, this quarterback, almost like a retreat. Um, but but you're, you're under uh, an intense microscope, maybe more intense than at your local high school. So 20 quarterbacks went out to L.A., to participate in that um, and, and sort of the big names lived up to the hype. You know, Kate Klubnick, the Clemson commitment out of Texas was the MVP for the elite 11. He was also our MVP at SI all American. We ranked all 20 quarterbacks every single day out there. Quinn Ewers, the big, big arm right-hander out of Ohio state um, held his own throughout the week. Nick Evers going to Florida was, was a pleasant surprise. He ends up in our top five, same as Devin Brown, the Arizona quarterback head of the USC. Um, so a lot of quarterbacks impressed. Uh, and then some some who were a little bit more inconsistent still had their moments as well. I'm talking uh, Miami quarterback commitment to Curry Brown, Rutgers commitment, uh, Gavin Wimsett, uh, you know, prospects like that, Penn State's Drew Aller. So a little bit of everything throughout that week. Uh, but it really is sort of the, the quintessential offseason event, maybe nationally, but certainly for the quarterback positions and the alumni who have won that event sort of speak for themselves. You know, Spencer Rattler's a Heisman front runner. He was the Elite 11 MVP, I think, three years ago. Tua Tinglebailoa won the MVP. Justin Fields won that MVP. Uh, the list sort of goes on and on. C.J. Stroud, who's about to be the guy at Ohio State, 
uh, won it a few years ago. So uh, it really it does have some transitive powers towards college football, which is which is sort of unlike a lot of these other off-season events. So I think that's why people do put a lot of stock uh, into the Elite 11, um, and it certainly didn't disappoint this year. Everyone is trying to copy the newest and latest in sports. It's just how it works. The copycat thing, copycat league all over the place. And, and in the NFL, it's probably the, the big dog in that world, as you know, John. And so everyone's trying to find the next Patrick Mahomes. How many times does the name Patrick Mahomes come up at these things? Every time a kid drops his arm angle and, and throws it a little bit sidearm, it could be five degrees, wow. and somebody will say, oh, Patrick Mahomes. You know, So, you know, Quinn Ewers, the, the, the kid I mentioned, headed to Ohio State out of uh, South Lake Carroll in the Dallas area, uh, he does this on Friday nights. Uh, he, he does it in camps. He does it kind of just messing around, and, and people will, will start to liken the two, especially because they're both – from the state of Texas, but good luck. You know, it's it's actually not good for these young quarterbacks to try to emulate that. This is that's a special arm and a special athlete. We all know the pedigree his father, you know, brought it to the major leagues. Uh, and, and Patrick had uh, Junior had some of that as well uh, coming up in the high school ranks. So kind of leave leave that to those guys with special arms. The Matt Staffords, these two sports stars who are great pitchers and quarterbacks. Not a lot of those on planet Earth. So allow them to, to manipulate their arm angles. We shouldn't be, um, you know, promoting 16-year-olds doing doing as much. But look, when you're a half a, a billion dollar player and a Super Bowl MVP and kind of the face, the young face of, of you know, America's number one sport, uh, it's going to happen. So uh, there could be worse things, but I do think it, it does slow down the development of some of these quarterbacks trying to do a, a little bit too much. And, and unfortunately, many of the adults in the room don't, don't help couple more quick ones for John Garcia Jr. on Twitter, at John Garcia underscore Jr., the director of football recruiting, Sports Illustrated. Give him a follow on Twitter. Um, are we looking at more of the same here going in? I mean, we're going to play a football season. We're getting back to normal, home crowds, etc. It's going to be fun. We're going to watch on Saturdays. But at the end of the day, John, I mean... <laughs> Bama, Clemson, Ohio State, you know, I mean, here we go again, right? And I'm sure the recruiting that you've seen that's happened from, you know, the class of 2021 uh, going into their freshman years here, I, it's more the same here, right? Nothing's changed. These guys are just top dogs and everybody's chasing them. Yeah, it's to the point, Mike, where those three programs you mentioned are, are sort of on their own plane. Georgia is kind of the the little brother of that group. Right. Just They've done every single thing but get over that final national title hump, you know, thanks to blown uh, coverage and cover two there a couple years back. But the recruiting uh, at Georgia is so the good. They just can't. It's so yeah, good. Yeah. The talent, uh, the, the whole thing is, is working there. Um, and, and they really should be included in that group. But my point here is that all of those programs are replacing big-time quarterbacks, first-round type quarterbacks, mm -hmm. right? Trevor Lawrence at Clemson, Justin Fields at Ohio State, Mac Jones at Alabama, uh, there are replacing quarterbacks. George is just figuring theirs out now. It'll be JT Daniels, and it should have been last year. Um, but everyone's sort of new at that quarterback position. Um, what other sport do we award top rankings and, and just the perception that, hey, they're just going to figure it out like we do in college football when all of these programs are replacing big-time quarterbacks, the most important position in sports, and we just say, you know what? You know, rinse and repeat. It's going to be Ohio State in the Big Ten. It's going to be Bama and Georgia in the SEC. Clemson will roll through the ACC. And it's all about whoever's going to find that next spot, whether it's Oklahoma, maybe USC or Oregon in the Pac-12 gets over that hump and, and makes the playoff. But the chalk is still the same despite all that quarterback turnover. It's just remarkable. We don't see that really in any other sport where there's just such a maybe women's basketball with UConn and Baylor and some of those where it's just like, okay, they're going to be up there. Uh, it, it's just remarkable to do it in a sport like football, the ultimate team sport, especially when you're transitioning at, at that all important position. How long does Nick Saban coach? You know, I think he signs through what, 25 or 26. Um, you, you know, you, you talk to those around the Alabama program and they say Nick is, is always in high gear. He's never, taken that first step back that you saw with, with Bobby Bowden and some of these other coaches who are just getting up there in age. You know, he's still in great shape. He's still an active recruiter. I mean, no head coach 
um, has recruited this well this long, uh, like Nick Saban has. So I think you'll start to see the signs from a recruiting perspective once the assistants start to take the bulk of, of, of the task. And once he takes a step back there, I think eventually it'll translate on the field. But you talk to recruits who were just there a couple of weeks ago. He's joking with them. He's, he's on the boat, you know, jet skiing and, and tubing with the kids. Um, he's, he's as active as he's ever been. He's cracking jokes on his current team. He's making fun of his players. He's just kind of living it up, chopping it up as, as he always has. Uh, so I don't know. I, I think this thing could go um, well into his 80s if he wanted to. Uh, and, and he's made it clear that he wants to retire, you know, in Tuscaloosa. So, um, you know, I, I hope it's not one of those where it's like Bobby Bowden and you're like, my goodness, this is getting kind of weird and, and uh, things aren't great. Uh, I hope it doesn't get to that point just for, for you know, history's sake. But um, there's really no signs of this guy slowing down. And, and that's becoming a storyline in and of itself. And, and, and how remarkable it, is. It, it sure is. And, I mean, if he decides to go – you know, that, that long, as you mentioned, I mean, we could be dealing with some ridiculous, I mean, the numbers now are ridiculous, right? Like the championships are, are absurd. I mean, he's got seven national championships for crying out loud, nine SEC titles, you know, all the coach of the year awards, blah, blah, blah. And then you look at what he did, you know, in the Mac, you look at the, the, the division championships in the SEC, that's now up to 13. But John, for goodness sakes, he's, he's 69. If he coaches another five, six, seven years, he might get to 10, 11 championships here. That's that's absurd. Now we're now we're dealing with Saban, we're Wooden, our back, Phil Jackson. We're dealing with those to Joe McCarthy, Casey Stengel. We're dealing with those kind of guys, you know? Absolutely, Mike. And, and I think, look, it's just not out of the realm of possibility. And I think 10 is that number, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. You, you, th- you think of you think of when even a relentless competitor like that can can sit back and kind of say, okay, like the job is done. Uh, maybe 10 is the number that will, will get him there. And look, right now, the pace Alabama's on, it's, it's right. It's just under every other year uh, where he's averaging a national title over the last decade plus. Uh, so if he continues on that pace, he's looking at, you know, being about 75, 76 when he gets to number 10. Um, so could that be what slows him down? I don't know. I mean, some of these older coaches, you just feel like they can coach forever. I Pete Carroll's 69. Bill Belichick is 69, you know, saving as well. I mean, it's just like, when are these guys going to start? Bayheim's still rolling. You know, Bayheim's still look, going. Look at Jimmy B, right? I mean, Gosh. after after Coach K took a step back, he, he made everyone, I'm sure, on your mind could ask that question, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. But, um, eh, you know, I'm going to co- coach struggling. Buddy's kids. I'm going to coach Buddy's kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's still sharp. He's still, uh, he'll still get on you as a reporter. Yeah. You know, flashback to my, to my grad school yeah, days. Yeah. I mean, and when those things start changing, I think you'll see a step back. But uh, it's just remarkable the shape these guys keep themselves yeah. in mentally and physically to be able to do so. And look at those guys. All those we mentioned, none of them are, are overweight or appearing to be slowing down physically. Mentally, they'll still get on you. Um, so if one of those two doesn't change, how, how can how can all of it change? So uh, just remarkable stuff. And, and one of those where, where we're reminded in 2020 was a great reminder you know, let's appreciate it while while it's there, because like you said, this thing's heading for a trajectory that we've certainly never seen um, in, in college football, and he's getting to that point where we haven't seen it up in college athletics, which is just crazy to think about. I mean, he's the greatest college football coach of all time for my money, and I would tell you that he has an opportunity to blow this thing out of the water. I mean, that's what we're dealing with here. Final question. You and I are talking in a couple of years, three, four, five years. What's the biggest change in football recruiting going to be at the D1 level? Oh, it's an IL, no doubt. Uh, it, it's the opportunity to maximize your value. Uh, we're going to see prospects who are millionaires before draft day. Uh, and that's not something that we've ever seen before from a legal standpoint, uh, certainly. Uh, but, but just think of a Trevor Lawrence. Oh, if, if he God. was a high school senior right now, oh. a kid that everybody – Everybody knew from his freshman year of high school was this guy going to the school, Clemson. Um, just imagine the marketing opportunities. Just imagine the hair product opportunities <laughs> that, that this kid that this kid would have had. He might have had, you know, a, a national head and shoulders campaign as an eighteen year old. Garcia, so, what uh, about Reggie Bush, Manzel, Tim Tebow, Cam Newton? Tebow, I mean, Tebow, Tebow would Tebow would have been the tops, no question. 
I think Tebow, exactly. I think in that in that range, you know, the last 15, 20 years, oh. Tim Tebow would have been that prospect. But in a short span, lightning in the bottle, my goodness, Johnny Football, oh. Cam Newton, even RG3, sure. the Dallas Metro, um, just in a short sample, my goodness, what they could have accomplished. But, yeah, I, I think it's going to change recruiting forever because now instead of here's our draft picks, here's our championships, here's all this, the money's going to be – public and available before the NFL. It's going to be like, hey, the last big time quarterback we signed from your state, you know, made 700K uh, before he ever stepped foot in the NFL. I mean, and that's going to sell. You're going to be able to change your family's fortune sooner. Um, that that possibility is, is going to change the game once all of this gray area stuff gets sorted out, once uh, both sides of the political spectrum sort out just exactly how revenue is going to start to be shared and how much more kids can take advantage with the video game coming back, all of those things. Um, it'll be a lot clearer in two, three years from now. So, yeah, I think the conversation will, will be just like it is in the NFL. It's going to be about money and then where you can, can have the most value. That's interesting because even if it strikes in a year or two, whatever, you think it's just going to keep going three, four, five years, it's still the story. It's going to be the story and you're probably – you're probably right. You think about the what would you know the Fab Five guys at UNLV, you know <laughs> Charlie Ward. I mean, some of these big guys from like the '90s and the early 2000s, even. I mean, NIL if it was around then, what how they could have benefited. Well, this has been great, John Garcia Jr. at John Garcia underscore Jr., the director of football recruiting for Sports Illustrated, SI Now, SI All American, the Yellowhammer Football Group as well. Go get them all on Twitter. Make sure you follow. John, this was incredible. Thank you uh, a million for coming on. Keep up the amazing work, and we'll talk down the line here, pal. Enjoy the season upcoming. Likewise, my friend. Always good to be on with you. The ML Sports Platter is brought to you by Welch & Company Jewelers. Go shop the showcase today, welchjewelers.com. That's welchjewelers.com. Daniel Luce and the gang doing an amazing job at Welch & Company Jewelers. Huge tip of the cap. Thank you as well to Stanley Law Office's Axe Exotic Pets and our great friends at CNY Electrical. If you're in and around Central New York, get on over to cnyelectrical.com. cnyelectrical.com. Man, they do such great work. Sean and his team all over the place. Commercial, residential, you name it. CNY Electrical on Facebook as well. Check out their services at cnyelectrical.com. I'm Mike Lindsley. Thanks for listening to the ML Sports Platter. Hit me on Twitter at Mike L Sports. As I always tell you, enjoy the games.